A Description of a Fountain in Canterlot's Gardens by Amit, with 98 thumbs up, 7 thumbs down, 27 comments, and 1,155 referrals. The tags for the story are Random, Slice of Life. In Canterlot's Gardens, there is a lightly damaged fountain. It's very old. The ponies that star in the story are Scootaloo, Princess Celestia, Princess Luna, and other characters. Archaeology, with 983 words. In Canterlot's Gardens, there is a fountain. It is three meters tall and consists of three layers built entirely out of marble. One of the tower's moon-shaped tips is visible past the hedges. The ornate topiary is a much brighter green near the window that allows it this view, and the parts that are brighter obscure the standard of the sun alongside it. The first layer is decorated primarily by transcriptions of Xenophon's descriptions of Luna on the east-facing hemicircle and understudy Florican's descriptions of Celestia facing the west. The former is an ancient Ibyaronic, and the latter is a classical Tarpian, so the latter's vowels can only be guessed at, and have been correctly, though with a minor exception. The word for carrying is transliterated as burdened by. There is no fault of the transliterator. The tradition was to train the occupation's teachers in the Misrishafian dialect, not the classical, and while they were once homophones, the meaning of the words have since changed. The description of the wings is phonetic. There is a slight shift here. A little barb of a quill jets out, too small to be seen, though a foal once cut herself brushing past it, and it turns somewhat smoother and loopier. It turns back to transliteration at the horn. The Ipriaronic is perfect and unremarkable. Its marble is unpolished, but there is no grime. Some moss has grown, but only around the edges of the east side, obscuring very little of interest but a dialogue on subjective morality. There is a very slight glow, mainly visible to Pegasi looking closely, where the writing meets the moss. The studious unicorn looking closely would find that the passages are meant to glow when read, but would then criticize the piece's enchanters for not generating Chiryatkov radiation with an isotope possessing a shorter half-life. A more studious unicorn would blame the text's reader for being too loud. Across its entire frame there are cracks. They go snaking from the west and stop just where the moss grows. The very tip of the farthest crack heralds beginning of the densest crop. The grass is not interrupted by this process, although a slight bit of cracked earth along the fountain's rim refuses to be watered. The second layer, held above by the clear water by a single wide pole, is similarly ornamented. A single bit of it is missing. It is lying on the grass next to the fountain, and the gap it creates lets a far greater amount of water cascade down at once, in conjunction with the third layer's similar defect. The piece in the grass to the west is mostly charred and unintelligible, but what of it that can read can and is printed on a little bit of brass nearby, half buried in the grass like a tombstone, be translated from the Tarbian? And the pink of her eyes betrays something other than benevolence, but a deeply smiling intelligence. A small blood stain lies wet on its side, covering a few more words, and it has for the last thousand years. Princess Celestia often jokes at her sister that she will use it if she ever needs a transfusion, and Luna glares at her for this every time. The piece from the upper layer is completely disintegrated. The upper layer's tip is rimmed with pure gold. The bit of marble jutting out of it and producing the ephemeral water from its tip is aluminum plated. It is overcompensating slightly for the hole in an attempt to make up for unoccupied space, but its enchantment is holding admirably. The fountain averages 20 visitors a month. There is a general uneasiness amongst its visitors, and they often leave quickly. It is not a very popular tourist spot, though certain Ashamites will include it in their pilgrimage. On Hajj, about a hundred or two hundred will pay their respects here. The royal guard, unlike with the fountain, is very careful with their guard of the blood-smeared fragment. There is usually one standing under the shade provided by the topiary. He has developed a certain uneasiness about it, but he often notes aloud, presumably to himself, that the duty is short and pays extra. He knows a little Oterion. This is because, as he will tell anybody that looks at it for a while, there is an inscription in the language in a little rectangle in the middle of the middle layer, and he will gladly translate it for a visitor who looks too long. 
the foundation of this great fountain laid by Otarian unicorns, inscribed by the descendants of their originators of both west and east, and presented to the goddess Celestia by the Otarian ambassador in lieu of Emperor Florican. And here he will pause to note that this isn't the same Florican who wrote the western inscription, the courageous, the mighty, under the grace of her will, in commemoration of the taking of rightful place at the head of one of the greatest bastions of the pony nation. He will note that some pony has before tried to use his tendency to explicate this before so as to make a run for the stone, but he turned and ran just as he got past the embedded translation. He will shrug, pause to take a deep breath, return to his duties. To its south, facing the opening in the topiary where most visitors enter, there is a steel plaque on a pedestal. It is leaved in gold and has four words on it at the top, the two of which are names. Celestia would have preferred it to be five but she did not commission the plaque. There are a few other words as well. They're simple ones. They tell the fountain's story for anyone too busy to look at it.